My Hero Academia Season 4 Episode 2. Wow, what a shocking episode, guys, right? I bet you didn't expect to see that coming. Uh, a pretty uh, graphic episode. Definitely the most graphic episode in the entire series. Uh, and definitely a landmark point overall as well. I mean, nothing is ever really going to be the same after this. Uh, and a fantastic adaptation of chapters 125 and 126. Really enjoyed this. Some supplementary stuff, and I'll try to go over everything that I remember, but let's get into it. So we're being fully introduced to the main villain of this season, and his name is Overhaul. And we actually saw him at the end of Season 3. I think it was like Episode 62 or something. But it turns out that he's the leader of like a minor Yakuza group by the name of the Shihai Hasakai. And it turns out that in this world, like, the Yakuza are, like, tier two to the villains. And that's because during All Might's, like, crazy reign of justice, like, he essentially wiped out all crime. So groups like the Yakuza and things like that are almost non-existent at this point. Uh, and also, like, when Mr. Compress is giving all of this exposition to Toga, I like how they added, like, that supplementary footage of, like, seeing, like, the Yakuza and other things like that. That's not how it is in the manga. So, job well done by Bones here. So, Overhaul is trying to come together with the League of Villains because now that All for One has been taken out, there's been, like, this power vacuum in the underworld of, like, the villains and just crime and stuff like that. So, they're trying to figure out who the next boss is. But we're also, like, seeing what his main motive is. And Overhaul needs money because he has this grandmaster plan that essentially needs a whole bunch of money. But no one is going to invest in him because he is, like, the leader of a Yakuza group. And as I said, they are tier two. And nobody really cares about the Yakuza anymore. Uh, so he's trying to gain the support and like and the whole entire League of Villains to add under him and he wants to be the leader of them so now that he has them under him more in, uh, investors will take him more seriously and he'll get more money that's at least his plan and Tomura wants no part of it uh, and he's like go home but then randomly Magna just decides to just go after Overhaul foolishly uh, it doesn't really seem like Tomura uh, asked him to do that, but, you know, I, I guess he just, he, he felt it. He felt the vibe, and he went after it. It was a vibe check, and uh, it obviously didn't turn out for him well. Uh, and then, oddly enough, Magnus starts giving, like, more in-depth uh, characterization to him. Something that hasn't really happened before, because we're hardly ever really uh, with Magna. Like, he's most prominently displayed during the training camp arc. You know, he has some cool moments there, and then he's kind of there in Kamino. But this is the most prominent Magna has been, and we're finding out, oh, oh it's because he's going to straight up die. <laughs> Magna is the first person to die in this series, as far as I know, at least on-screen death like this. And this is brutal. Uh, like, we're seeing Overhaul's quirk for the first time here, or at least on display. We see a glimpse of it in uh, episode 62, like when we first see him, but you have to really kind of pay attention uh, and understand what you're looking at. So I can't exactly tell you in depth what Overhaul's quirk is because they haven't explained it in the series yet, and I don't want to spoil anything for you. But it appears that he can just straight up make you explode just by touching you, and I love the way that they adapted, uh, the adaptation of this from the manga, because I was always thinking like, okay, so how is this gonna happen? Because in the manga, it just looks like Overhaul is just touching Magna's arm. But in this, he's like scratching it almost. And then he just explodes. And I like the way like his skin bubbles. And then, then he just pops after that. The bubbly skin stuff, that's not in the manga. So that's a great little touch by Bones there. And, and when I did see this scene originally, uh, and, and along with all of the other uh, carnage and, and graphic violence in this, I was always like, how are they going to adaptate this to the anime? Are they going to tone it down too much? Or are they going to wash it out? But I think they did it just right. Now, guys, they can't obviously make it too graphic. This is a shonen after all. But I think they did it, you know, just enough to where it's not alienating the older viewers, but it's not too much for, like, the... Uh, Whoever the advertisers are in Japan or whatever the regulations are, they just did it really well. Now, of course, we're not going to see entrails and stuff like that. And we kind of see, like, stuff like that in the manga if you look closely. But, man, I just really like the way that they did this. I like the way Magni pops and the blood goes on the screen and the blood goes everywhere. Uh, so, so cool. Uh, also, when Tomura comes in. Uh, the way that he annihilates that one dude. We never get his name as far as I know. Maybe in like a data book or something we get his name. But uh, the guy that he's like, shield! And then he just pops in uh, instantly. And then he takes the force of uh, Omura, uh, Tomura's decay quirk. 
That, of course, is much more graphic in the manga. You get a good glimpse of that guy just, like, disintegrating on the ground. But the way that they made him, like, turn almost to ash uh, in the anime, very well done. Uh, so let's get into this uh, quirk uh, bullet thing, this tranquilizer dart-looking thing. So when Mr. Compress goes after Overhaul, uh, immediately he gets hit with, like, this bullet thing. And, and evidently his quirk can't work. And then Overhaul takes Mr. Compress's arm. So at least he didn't die, but yeah, still pr adding to the graphic violence here. Uh, so apparently, Overhaul and his crew are in possession of quirk nullifying technology. And we see later, like, when the rest of his boys pop in, like, four more of his underlings pop in. Uh, I can't go over their names because they haven't been revealed yet, but we see one of them with the white cape, uh, the white cloak, the white hood, and he has a gun. So we know that it's coming out of a gun, and we know that he was, like, watching by. So they have, like, these bullets that can just straight up cancel your quirk out, which is insane. We haven't seen anything like this before. The only one that was capable of doing this was Aizawa. And other than that, there was no other, like, quirk nullifying technology. So this is huge. This is awesome also, and of course, we're going to get more into this. Uh, but as for that, they kind of just agree to a ceasefire after that there's like there's gonna be no more bloodshed we don't we, we don't need to lose any more people because uh, overhaul while he probably could you know do more stuff there as we were the league of villains could do more stuff they're kind of like look i need you i i need you all right i need you for my ultimate plan to get more money so i'm not going to take you all out and i'm not going to have you take out more of my guys let's just go back to our corners uh, and let cooler heads prevail and whatnot so they're going to come back later and try to renegotiate something else. But uh, very, very cool uh, little sequence here. Definitely the most violent of the series so far. So then it cuts to UA and we're finding out from Aizawa that the internship slash the hero work studies has been approved. And they were talking about this at the very end of season three. This might've been episode 62 as well. We see like Nezu give this big like press conference when he was talking about all of this stuff. And then Aizawa's like, well, we're gonna have a faculty meeting and we'll see if it's gonna be approved or not. So it has been approved. But all of the first years can only go to, like, accomplished agencies. So then they're, like, trying to figure out where Izuku's going to go. Obviously, we found out at the end of Season 3 that he can't go back with Gran Torino because he's doing his own thing. So he doesn't have time for that. So he's, he goes to All Might. He's like, all right, All Might, what can I do? You know, who do I go to? And he said, like, go to Night Eye. He's my former sidekick. But then we're finding out that All Might can't talk to him them, himself. They have some kind of like beef or there's something going on between them as to where All Might doesn't want to talk to Sir Night Eye. Uh, so he gets Mirio to do it. And we get this supplementary scene here where like Mirio's walking through the halls and uh, he finds out that he's got a call from All Might and he's like, well guys, looks like I tow Gata or Gata too or whatever he says. He says something really corny and it's funny. It reminds me of like Hillary Clinton's uh, Pokemon go to the polls moment. So then, uh, you know, it, then we get the whole thing where Mirio is going to convince her Night Eye to get uh, Izuku back into his agency and all of that. And we go through all the motivations and everything. So this is essentially going to be like the, the crew here. It's going to be Mirio and Izuku under Night Eye, at least for now. But then it cuts to back to the dorms and we see Bakugo and Todoroki. And they're going to be going to their provisional weekend training because they failed the provisional licensing exam. So they need to take like uh, weekend courses in order to make up for it. Now, if you're getting excited to see these guys do that, I'm going to hold, you should hold off on that because we're not going to see them for quite a bit, but we will eventually see what they are doing with their provisional weekend course. So all the Bakuzu, uh, Bakuzu, Bakugo and Todoroki fans, you will get your fill, but uh, you're going to have to wait a little bit. So then we cut to Night Eye's agency and we see like what's going on there. They're observing what exactly happened between uh, Overhaul's crew, the Shi'ai Sakai, and what happened with the League of Villains. How there was like a big hole in the wall and that's because his crew busted in there to save him. And apparently what Bubble Girl is telling him is making like Sir Night Eye think that there needs to be more laughter or whatever. Uh, also, Bubble Girl, uh, fun little fact about her, she was like a fan-submitted character. Like, apparently Horikoshi had, like, this little contest where you submit your characters to him, and then he picked uh, two of them. We'll see the other one later on, but Bubble Girl was the first one. I think this was, like, in 2015, maybe this happened. So, it, it was, like, in the infancy of the series, essentially. Like, two years into it or something. Maybe even before that. But then he puts her onto, like, this machine that tickles her, which is insane torture. And if this were to happen in real life, this would be like a 
major harassment suit. Night Eye would get me too to, into cancellation. <laughs> but that's a whole other story for another time. And then uh, Mirio's like, hey, if you really want to get on Night Eye's uh, good, so uh, good side, you got to make him laugh. So the only thing that <laughs> Izuku knows to do to make somebody laugh is put on the All Might face. The All Might face comes back. It's hilarious, at least to us viewers. Uh, we also saw this, I think he did it to like All Might in Season 3, right? He was like, when they were talking, and he was uh, briefing him on uh, the history of All for One and everything, he was like, do you remember when we first met? Uh, do you remember what I told you to do to take my quirk? And he's like, eat this. You know, that epic little funny moment. So he does the face again, and we're seeing that like he tr he practiced, practiced it like his, uh, most uh, of his childhood in order to get it just right. That's how he's able to do it so good. But uh, Sir Night Eye sees this as him ridiculing All Might, and that's where the episode ends. It's like, oh my god, he didn't make him laugh. What's going to happen? Does he hate Izuku? Well, we're going to find out in the next episode. And as we see in the next, uh, the preview for the next episode, he's going to be going through the trials of Night Eye, if you will. He's going to be going through all of this stuff in order to gain the trust and... Uh
become one of the sidekicks or just become an intern of Night Eye here. And that's essentially what the whole episode is going to pertain to. Maybe they'll add some League of Villains stuff too, but uh, the main part of that episode is just going to be Izuku convincing Night Eye that he's good enough. But uh, that's pretty much it for the episode. I love this one. Fantastic. I can't wait for the rest of this season. It's been so well uh, adapted so far. We're only two episodes in. This is actually the first canon episode, but if you like the review, guys, please give it a like. I also have a Patreon. It gives you access to a weekly Q&A. And if you haven't already, please subscribe as well. Have a great day.